I used to think it was going to be entirely your problem, but the rate of change is so fast that it is clear that uh, your generation and my generation are going to share uh, many of the, the problems around uh, climate change. Each of us have a personal responsibility, and I think that is key because uh, it is the collective action of all, but none of us should think that just because it takes all to act for success, that that means we individually shouldn't do anything. So I encourage you all to do your part, whatever you think that is, and uh, be prepared to be part of the conversation going forward. Hello, my name is Brian Schmidt, and I'm the Vice Chancellor and President of the Australian National University here in Canberra, Australia. And it's my uh, pleasure to be able to talk to you today a little bit about uh, my thoughts of ground climate change. And so I uh, congratulate the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate for this initiative and hope that uh, my thoughts resonate and look forward to hearing your thoughts. So I'm first asked to talk about a personal story about what makes me care about climate change. And I'm actually going to do two. I grew up in the United States in the state of Alaska. And when I was a child, or even in high school, uh, I used to go and visit the glaciers near Anchorage, Alaska. It's just something that we did um, all the time. And when I took my family back to Alaska a couple years ago, before the pandemic, I was going to show them all these uh, these glaciers that I used to go and hike on and and uh, watch calve into the water, and they were all gone. Every single one of them gone, gone for the rest of my life, and really highlights how fast the world is changing. And for me, not being able to share that kind of important part of my childhood with my family here in Australia, I think was uh, quite an eye opener to me and uh, really makes you think. The other way I want to reflect on climate change is here, I live on a farm just outside of Canberra. And one of the things that uh, I have is a vineyard, a vineyard that grows Pinot Noir a grape that is renowned uh, for making wonderful wine, especially in the area of Burgundy in France, just north of the town of Lyon, the big town in the center of France. So I planted my vineyard when I was quite young in the year 2000, so I was 33 in 2000. Uh, and it was a, a vine, a wine grape that I thought would really thrive here in Canberra. Canberra is uh, quite cool, probably cooler than people realize. For Australia, it's one of the coldest places in Australia. We typically back then used to get snow here three or four times a year. But since 2000, the average temperature here on my vineyard has risen by about two and a half degrees. And we've gotten into a cycle between drought and uh, really wet seasons. So it used to be every season we could expect, oh, roughly 600 mils of rain during the year. And now we have some years that have less than 300 mils, so very dry, and other years where we have more than a meter of rain, so very wet. And uh, that is certainly changing uh, what it's like to grow grapes here in Canberra. And it just sort of tells you about climate change. It's not one thing, it's many things, but it's different. And it means the way you're used to, have to do things are gonna have to change. And uh, it really brings it home here in a very personal way. So how can we inspire and empower the younger generation to take a lead in efforts to protect our planet? Well, I think we need to involve you in the decision-making that we're undertaking because it is your generation that is going to inherit most of the problems. I'm 54 years old, and actually I realize now that I'm going to inherit many of the problems uh, in the last uh, decades of my life. I used to think it was going to be entirely your problem, but the rate of change is so fast that it is clear that uh, 
your generation and my generation are going to share uh, many of the, the problems around uh, climate change and, and global sustainability. So from my perspective, I want to involve your generation in, in solving the problem, having you sit down, help chart solutions, uh, and help you know, make the decisions about what we do and we don't do uh, in response uh, to the challenges that lie ahead. Uh, and you should feel empowered. You should feel empowered to say, this is our lives, and we need to be part of the decision-making and solutions going forth. The earth is the only home we have, and climate change is the greatest threat to our home faces. How do we rise above our differences and face this challenge united to the core? That's a question I ask myself. There is a view in some circles, here in Australia especially, but also around the world, that you know, we individually are a small part of the problem. Uh, why should I give up when actually what I do is just a, a drop in the ocean? But of course, the collective action matters. And what happens in Australia affects China, affects Vietnam, affects the United States, the United Kingdom, India, every country on the planet. And collectively, we can make a difference. And so we need to work together uh, because if we don't work together, then we all suffer together. And I think getting that to everyone's head, that this is something that we have to do together, no matter what, uh, is really, really important. And so it is certainly um, my intent to work closely with the entire world on this. Uh, and that's why I think the uh, Global Alliance of Universities on Climate is such an important initiative, bringing together institutions from around the world. What do I think is the legacy of our work here? Well, I hope that uh, the legacy is that we take meaningful, united work together to uh, slow down climate change and eventually reverse it. We can take this opportunity to work and understand each other. Universities have this unique ro role in society where we are able to reach out and do things together, even as our politicians, for example, find it difficult. So from my perspective, we need to make sure that we keep the bridges across cultures uh, open. We continue to work, show how it's done, and then that allows when others are ready that uh, most of the hard work has already been done and we have paved the road uh, to the future. Climate X is a unique and unprecedented call to arms against climate change. How can the meeting of academic minds, young voices and leaders spur us to action against climate disruptions? Ultimately, effective advocacy lies with evidence. And so being able to create a body of evidence that we all share across the world, across generations, that is the beginning of being able to make meaningful arguments to the people in charge of what needs to be done. If people in one part of the world are arguing for one thing based on a different set of evidence, than people on the other, it's very easy to be divided uh, and not have common purpose. So I do believe that that generational meeting of people from around the world, that is what we need to create a common set of ideas, a uh, common set of uh, evidence, so that we can have a common set of arguments. 2021 has been a wake-up call with record-setting temperatures, flooding, and fires. Are we at a tipping point on climate change? It's not just 2021. In 2020, I had to close my campus here in Australia in the largest set of fires that Australia has known in modern times, and fires that have really, uh, I, I think, been uh, unsurpassed around the world. 
So it's not just been 2021, it was 2020, and it were, there were problems before these. These have just been the next level. Uh, the flooding we have seen associated with uh, especially uh, intense uh, summer rain events, very strong cyclones. Uh, we are seeing not so much a tipping point, I see, but rather the ramifications of what 1.2 degrees of climate warming looks like. And, you know, we've been pretty good at predicting the total temperature change. We have not been very good at predicting the extremes of temperatures that have emerged, nor what it seems to be more intense flooding and drought. And of course, uh, with the uh, drought and very hot temperatures, fires. My father lives in Canada and uh, his part of British Columbia has been forever changed by this last summer's unprecedented temperatures. The temperatures he experienced in the mountains of British Columbia exceeded the temperatures I have ever experienced here in Canberra in the middle of Australia. The change is real and it is not something any of us want to live with. We were reflecting on the phone call that I had with him last week that it wasn't very pleasant living in this type of weather uh, and it was hard to contemplate having to live with it for the rest of our lives. Imagine if it's not 1.2 degrees, but it's two, three, four, or even five degrees. It will be a less, less pleasant uh, planet for humans to live on. So what is our university doing to mitigate the impact of these increasing extreme climate occurrences? We have a big program called Below Zero, ANU Below Zero. And so we are looking at how the university can, as quickly as possible, uh, get down to net zero emissions uh, and then move to below zero emissions by 2030, uh, offsetting uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases through our own research and implementation here in Australia. So that's one way to uh, slow down climate change and hopefully help show the world how we might do it at a local level. But we're also looking at other things, the environmental uh, uh, impacts and how we need to start looking uh, at adaptation. How do we change, for example, farming practices? How do we change uh, the use of plastics? We have uh, new work and a startup that is looking at how to essentially take existing, you know, messy recycled plastic and put it back in the form of monomers, the basic constituents that are used to create plastics afresh. So we are working on a whole range of topics, research and otherwise, about the technological, but also the sociological aspects. You know, humans have to actually go about and make the changes uh, that a technology affords, and there are trade-offs, and we need to be prepared to work across the whole gambit uh, of activities. And so Mark Howden uh, is a member, uh, a vice chair of the IPCC report that's just been um, released. He also chairs our Below Zero uh, steering group. And from my, protect, my, my point of view is we have to look at the lens of, of climate in everything we do, from our own operations at a university uh, to the research we work in essentially all areas of, of studies. So some other things that you wanted to know about, sea level uh, rising here in Australia. Well, one of the advantages of living in Canberra at about 750 meters above sea level is I don't have to worry about it so much here. But Australia, where you know almost 95% of our population lives on the coast, it is a big issue. Uh, and I don't even think people have started to think about Sydney Harbor with, for example, two meters more water. Uh, think of Melbourne uh, and the Yarra River being uh, completely inundated uh, with no easy way to control uh, the, the, the water and the tides. Uh, Perth would be similarly affected, Adelaide, Brisbane would be particularly strongly affected uh, as it is one of the lo lowest lying cities that we have in Australia and almost two and a half million people. So catastrophic, absolutely, 
uh, for uh, our cities here and uh, trillions of dollars probably of impact um, if we have sea level rises of two meters or something. But even the small rises we have now are causing uh, existing properties to fall into the sea whenever there are big storms and we're going to expect that to get worse and worse and worse. Almost half the world's natural disasters occur within the Asia Pacific region. Uh, do we think, do I think events trigger uh, like this can trigger climate refugees? Oh yeah, uh, already happening. We work, of course, here uh, at ANU with the Pacific. We have one of the largest Pacific studies programs in the world. Uh, and already I am working with, for example, the leaders of Kiribati about how we're going to manage uh, that country, uh, a country's future. Uh, but the problems are, of course, not going to be just Kiribati. Uh, it's going to affect uh, the main islands like Fiji, uh, where we're working extensively uh, with the University of uh, the South Pacific about uh, what the future might look there with respect to uh, cyclone uh, adaptation, because it appears they're going to have more problems with that uh, over time. Changes in uh, aquaculture, fisheries, uh, and the whole management of the South Pacific uh, as things get worse and worse. If we move further across, uh, into, for example, Bangladesh uh, and that region, which will have huge land losses due to uh, climate change. Uh, we, we, we can expect um, our part of the world to uh, have tens of millions, maybe more, of climate refugees uh, over the coming 50 years or so. Uh, and that's not even beginning to think about the issues of the glacial melt for example, out of the Himalayas, uh, stopping essentially the flow of the Mekong in the way that we're used to. So huge issue and potentially the most destabilizing issue for humanity, in my opinion. How can we inspire the world to see the existential threat of climate change? Oh, I wish I knew how to get uh, the decision makers of the world to understand that this is an existential threat, that there is no plan B, and that uh, by making life just that little bit easier right now, we are sacrificing the future in a way that is uncomprehendable. So we need to keep talking about it. Education, education, education. We need to make sure everyone knows what is at stake so that we can continue to undertake the research and technological advances to mitigate the problems as much as possible. In the end, each of us have a personal responsibility, and I think that is key because uh, it is the collective action of all, but none of us should think that just because it takes all to act for success, that that means we individually shouldn't do anything. So I encourage you all, to do your part, whatever you think that is, and uh, be prepared to be part of the conversation going forward. Thank you once again for having this opportunity to talk to you, uh, and uh, let's fight this uh, fight together, and I look forward to hopefully having a chance to meet you in person in the years ahead. Cheers.